My guest today is Prasanna Penze. Prasanna, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you, David? I'm doing very well. Tell us, what do you do for a living? Yeah, I work at a company called ThoughtWorks. We are a global uh, software services company. And uh, my role is that of the global director for AI strategy. So I look after our uh, AI services, solutions, uh, as well as partnerships and research. Global director of AI strategies sounds really important. So I assume it is, uh, but it's you're just, talking, I think you're talking to It's a sufficiently ambiguous uh, title. <laughs> yeah, with, it is. Well, it, maybe it's only ambiguous because there's so much hype about AI these days, particularly generative AI. You know, our friends over at OpenAI created ChatGPT, which I think really caught the public's attention. And uh, is, it, is that translated into your customers wanting to build AI solutions? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, this role was created in response to the hype uh, that we have around generative AI. And one of our perspectives was that this is an opportunity to um, add value to our clients, not just through generative AI, but also through other AI techniques. And so generative AI, because of the attention it's getting, opens the doors for um, a number of other techniques, sometimes simpler techniques that can actually solve the problem. So we mm -hmm. thought that we would um, kind of uh, do both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not every solution requires AI. Uh, but um, are you so? Do you find that your customers are coming to you with specific ideas about how to use AI within their environment, or are they coming to you asking for that? Help us to understand how we can better use AI. I think it has shifted over time. Um, initially, it started out with, what is this thing? Uh, is this an opportunity or a threat? How should we make an enterprise strategy that you know uh, reacts to this in a way that um, manages the downside while opening up some of the upside? And so that was kind of how, how a lot of the conversation started. And uh, then it shifted to, um, we have a number of POCs to do. Uh, there are a number of ideas uh, help us just get one or two off the ground. You know, let's let's do a handful, uh, and that handful became hundreds over time that a lot of companies have done. Uh, and then the conversation shifted to: we're doing so many experiments, so many POCs. Can you help us consolidate these things into platforms um, that are that kind of uh, create the one right way to handle things like versioning of data, the, the security aspects, and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, so that we're not making mistakes as we look to scale this. Um, and then um, now it has shifted into how do we, okay, fine, we've done a number of experiments, we've built some consistency. How do we actually take these into production and start making money from these things? How does that look? Uh, yeah, making money is the key because that's generally why you implement a technology solution is not for the, the technology itself, but you have some business value you want to add. Um, how, how are you helping with them, your customers with that? How are they making money with this? Are they uh, are there clear paths to monetizing AI? I think it is. It has been challenging. I think the there are paths, but the road to get there is not as um, easy as it looks at the beginning. Because with generative AI and especially like the RAG pattern, we talk about the retrieval augmented generation. Mm -hmm. um, it is so easy to get a Hello World app up and running. Just drag and drop a bunch of PDFs into one of the web-based tools and boom, you have a chatbot that does it. Mm -hmm. um, and then what happens is expectations from executives go sky high because it is so easy to get uh, a basic POC done and then you have expectations to get it into production, scale it across all of our customers, scale it across our enterprise mm -hmm. um, in you know another two weeks or two months. And as we know from the rest of software, getting things into production is not so simple. Um, and then there's a other question of how does this actually get adopted? Um, and how does that adoption actually drive value to the enterprise, whether in terms of cost savings or in terms of additional revenue? Um, there's a risk associated with all of those things as well. 
Uh, wow, you brought up a couple of things here. Um, one is just the idea of going from a Hello World application into something that's really enterprise ready. I mean, you mentioned security, you mentioned scalability and things like that. Th those are things that are common across all enterprise applications. Those aren't unique to AI. Are, are there challenges that are unique to AI solutions that we need to think about? I think the there are two types of things there. The, it is the people who are, let's say, security experts need to understand AI in order for them to be able to even say, hey, does this thing look good or, or not? Ah. Um, and then there's uh, at, at kind of one level. And at the other level, you need the people who understand the AI side of it to kind of highlight potential issues to say that, hey, I, I know that um, I'm not a security expert, but I think this thing is um, maybe an issue. Can we look at this from a security lens? And because not all, security people are not going to be able to, who are new to AI, uh, are not going to be able to imagine all the ways that this technology can go. So you need kind of both sides of that to work together. Um, there are some things that are unique to AI in the sense that, um, well, first of all, most of the popular AI tooling is hosted in on the cloud. And so the first question is, are you an enterprise that has a an agreement with a cloud provider that protects your data uh, or not? And some enterprises do, some enterprises don't. And um, so that's kind of one shift is to moving, getting the cloud piece in place um, and getting like some security departments are not um, aligned with that uh, direction, generally speaking, right? Uh, but of course, that is reducing uh, as time goes on. Um, then it becomes a question of um, of what kind of data are you allowed to put into this thing? What when you when you democratize access to AI tooling, um, you're essentially increasing the surface area of people uploading things that they shouldn't into that particular thing. Let us say that you are allowed to use a cloud provider, but only for certain classes of data. Certain classes of data are not to be exported onto the cloud. But mm. if you make this tool available, people can upload whatever they want. And uh, how do you then control that? So then uh, there's a training aspect. There's how do you detect that the wrong thing got uploaded and prevent it from going in, all of that. So I think it's um, partly a human challenge of getting people to understand what they can and cannot do, uh, and the security people also to understand how to mitigate those risks, and a technical challenge in this in the sense of how do you um, make access control kind of baked into um, access control and data classification kind of baked into your data ecosystem so that people are aware that what they can and cannot do. So it's kind of both sides of it. Yeah, this is going to some good points. These Hello World applications, which are so easy to do with drag and drop, um, they they don't necessarily take that into account. You need to take a step back and, and build Even that, a so. simple thing, um, like a lot of the tooling uses a default setting that you that the data that you, the prompts that you provide and the responses to that can be used to improve the model. Mm -hmm. um, that's the default setting. Is, you know, like, is, are you comfortable with that or do you want to turn that off? And what is the implication of turning that off? I think those are questions sure. that people need to ask. And if each POC is creating their own uh, connection with an external provider, then that decision needs to be repeated. And that's kind of where the platformification comes in. You make that decision once as an enterprise that we are okay with these things and you, you know, leverage that across the enterprise. Uh, makes sense. Um, let's talk a little about the monetization of AI applications. What kind of solutions are you seeing that are actually making money for your customers? Yeah, so if uh, if you take a pattern approach, uh, the, the basic pattern is uh, RAG-based systems are all the rage at this point, right? Because I think uh, that's probably the first or even the only enterprise use case for uh, generative AI that is getting any traction at this point. There are probably a number of others that are, in, are not getting the traction. Um, specifically, RAGs are used to uh, ma manage knowledge in some way. It's about uh, a way to 
take expert knowledge and make it a little bit more accessible and easier to uh, understand within the context of something the person is trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so we all know uh, that you know in all enterprises, there are a number of decks and number of policies and all of that stuff that's written up somewhere. Um, if you happen to find the document, it's you know 70 pages and <laughs> you need to find that one paragraph that answers your question and it's it's not so, it hasn't been that easy with enterprise search solutions. So sure. broadly speaking, we see uh, the applicability of uh, of this, starting with that type of a use case, access to knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and in one of the clients, uh, we did this, uh, the team working on that uh, came up with this framework of, um, of search, ask, do, meaning the use cases start with, initially it's just a search use case, help me find the source document that talks about this. Let me read it and make my own decision. Um, you move from there to an ask use case where you have a chatbot where you're actually interacting and asking the next level of question. Mm -hmm. And then you move into kind of the third, which is do, which is where agents and uh, things like that come into uh, the picture where you uh, have the agent automatically do things. So when we extract up one more level from knowledge where the money comes from is when you have an expert in a particular area who is highly paid um, and their job, while they're adding value for most of the time, they're parts of their job, which are mundane tasks. And uh, if you can automate those away or make them more efficient, then you're creating better leverage out of the experts time. Um, so I think that's essentially the pattern that we see across industries, across um, a lot of other functions. So uh, one example is um, drug discovery research. So the researcher is spending time looking, classifying data, trying to figure out cleaning the data and manually reading a number of papers to try to identify uh, whether this thing has been done or not, uh, looking through existing uh, research data to see, you know, whether that particular research has happened or not. I think using generative AI, you can, and, a, and kind of a rag based solution, you can optimize their time uh, so they can focus on adding value that they're uniquely qualified for as opposed to this. Uh, same thing in um, financial analysts are using generative AI because they have to read the thousands of 10Ks to figure out what, what they should do and to identify patterns across them. So uh, any place essentially where there is a expert that is highly paid, uh, you can uh, create better leverage of their time by using generative AI. I think that's pretty much the pattern. Yeah, I've seen that before. Like I was talking with someone recently uh, about um, the value of a chatbot. A chatbot is, my definition, it's not personal because it's not a human being. And it, so it, it the service seems a little bit impersonal, but it does provide the value that you just described, which is that it can answer a lot of these questions really quickly and then escalate it potentially to a human being if they can't answer it. But the idea, the point that was made to me and it resonated was that, that would you rather wait 20 minutes for a human being to ask this question or would you rather have that question answered in one minute by a bot? And if those are the options, it's, it's clearly that one minute is better. It's the, the, yeah, and sometimes that twenty minutes becomes two hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. sometimes I'm being optimistic that yeah. you know uh, human beings don't scale really well. <laughs> yes, and it's also uh, one of the interesting things is that if the topic that you're looking at is sufficiently complex, how many people do you need to tap into to answer that question? Yeah, so point. if you Take the example, going back to kind of uh, drug discovery research, let's say in cancer oncol uh, oncology research, um, you have these fields of proteomics, genomics, uh, immunology, radiology, uh, and, and so on. And, and each one has depth in it. And so if you're looking to answer, answer a particular question, it, you can't just ask one person who will know about all of these things. You have to go to like five or six people, um, whereas if you have a single LLM based uh, bot or a multi-agent system where you have different experts in different fields that have been fine-tuned for with that data set, um, you can get much better, faster answers than talking to a single human. I like great example. Thanks. One I hadn't thought of too. 
Um, talk. A, you mentioned some of the challenges about reasons why people are slower to adopt AI solutions. Are, are there other ones that you can bring up? And if so, you know, how can we overcome those? Yeah, there are a number. Um, so the simplest one is probably cost. Uh, the when you do a POC, it's you, it, you're not utilizing it that much. Um, but one uh, clear thing is that if you want to scale a Gen AI use case, uh, you're going to be spending you know per token amount, and that thing is going to scale really quickly. And it's not that predictable because you have and like you don't know how much demand you're going to get for a particular uh, type of a use case. So if if essentially it gets a lot of traction and people are using it, then your cost kind of skyrockets. Um, but one thing we've been seeing in the world of AI is the costs have been coming down. I think gener uh, you know open AI has slashed their cost every time they've um, had an opportunity and the competition is creating a, a, a more reasonable cost structure. Um, so I think that is happening, but there's um, there's some other tools that you can use to kind of balance out uh, the cost and manage that. Uh, I think that, that's, that has been one. The other in... Um, is actually the inability to quantify the business value because you haven't been tracking, you, you haven't uh, calculated the baseline in the first place. So let's say that you're a, you're a legal firm that that is trying to automate some of the document analysis stuff that right. that you're doing. If you have the detail level tracked data, it's easier for you. But if you haven't done that aspect of it, then that's a prerequisite. So there are a number of Pre data, especially in the data side, uh, the number of prerequisites that need to happen that haven't happened yet. So you can't make the best use of AI until you get the data house in order. Um, and one other big one is compliance. If you look at some industries, financial services, for example, uh, the compliance requirements, the regulatory requirements are written for traditional machine learning models uh, that they don't translate one-on-one -on -one with generative AI. Uh, not just because it is, you know, it has hallucinations and it can have uh, that. But uh, for example, uh, I was talking to one of our uh, clients and they were mentioning uh, the Federal Reserve requirement called SR 11-7, which talks about, uh, along with model evaluation and monitoring, it also talks about having traceability into exactly what data was used to train a particular model. Now, none of these LLM companies are going to give you that. So the so um, so in financial services, if you have to use LLMs in production and it is at a in a category of use cases that needs to comply with SR eleven seven, either you can convince your auditor or the regulator that it's okay, or you have to train your own, which becomes a super expensive um, right. proposition, which may not be worth it at that point. Interesting. Uh, are there, is there anything we haven't covered that you feel is critical to this topic? I think uh, one big area is just the um, kind of the, the way that people have been operating has not been um, up to what technology provides in terms of getting software into production. I think a lot of those things are needed to get AI into production and things like if you haven't been doing you know continuous integration with software properly you doing continuous integration with AI is like one order of magnitude uh, more complex uh, if you haven't been doing version control for code properly by using a lot of branches and all of that stuff uh, and not really merging to main often enough you are you're going to have that craziness happen with your model versions and your data versions and the, and that's going to explode. So I think a lot of the things that we're seeing is the maturity of just CI, CD practices that are lacking in uh, enterprises. And now you try to put AI on top of that. It's just exasperate. Uh, it's, it's making that uh, challenge uh, worse. Great point. Good opportunity for uh, folks like uh, ThoughtWorks to add value, to fix these processes. Uh, yeah, and I think it's, it's creating a, a direct path to being able to show value, right? Like you're able to say, okay, this is the cost savings or new market that's going to open up. And these are all the processes that you need to fix to do that. And so you can do it in a way that 
has traceability to value, which is which is critical. Otherwise, why are we doing this, right? Why well, indeed. <laughs> Prasanna, thank you so much for your time. This was really educational. Thank you so much, David. Good to be here. David and I actually went to the same university, and that's kind of one of the ways uh, in which we connected. And um, so I look at David as being a friend uh, who is uh, driving the conversation around technology forward through his podcast, Technology and Friends. Go green. Go green. Go white. <laughs>